Good? All right, let's jump in. A um, few of you hopefully uh, at home still uh, tuned in for our Bible class, and um, the data show that I, I couldn't get a clear sense of it, but uh, the data showed that there were people that uh, went back last week and watched this uh, later on Sunday or Monday or later in the week uh, on the recording. So uh, welcome. When, whatever, whatever time in the present or future uh, you're joining us, um, welcome. And let's jump into Jeremiah 32, or at least that's what we're going to do this morning. Um, I did want to start with a little bit of review because I added a few more um, fill in the blanks. So most of these all the way through will be familiar, but uh, there's a few at the end from the more recent chapters that I wanted to throw in there. Um, again, these are uh, fill in the blank verses from Jeremiah as a way to keep in our minds the key uh, terms, the key phrases, and the key ideas uh, that are being expressed. Um, by the prophet, by God in the book. So chapter 2, verse 13, the people, God says, have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out for themselves um, cisterns, he says, broken cisterns that hold no water. So the contrast there between what uh, God is offering and what the people are turning to. Um, the false prophets, uh, God has a word for them in chapter 6, that they have healed the wound of my people lightly saying peace peace when there is no peace this is a key idea in the book that things are bad uh, in judah and jerusalem but the prophets deny it they say everything's fine uh, when it's not the case in chapter 6 two verses later god makes his offer not a offer of superficial peace like the prophets the false prophets are offering but he says if you will look to the ancient paths and walk in the good way you will find Rest for your souls. And Jesus picks up on that in Matthew chapter 11. Okay, chapter 7 is one of the key passages for identifying the failure of the people. Uh, the temple sermon, Jeremiah says, Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves or a den of robbers in your sight? They thought that just because they had the temple that they could worship in um, every week or whenever uh, they, they worship there throughout the year, that because they had that, they were fine. They were okay. Um, chapter 9, a passage that Paul will refer to in the book of 1 Corinthians. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who exercises steadfast love. Uh, there's our term uh, from the sermon this morning, by the way. Uh, he exercises steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. That's who God is. And so if you're going to boast in anything, put your confidence in anything, put your confidence in him. Okay, uh, on the other side of that, in terms of what not to, to put your confidence, chapter 10, verse 23, Jeremiah says, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. Um, a critical idea just in general in uh, the, the uh, teaching of the Bible uh, Lean on the, lean on your, do not lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Um, okay. And then uh, the next section of the book here, blessed is the man. This is the same idea, the same contrast here. Uh, on one hand, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. He will be like a tree planted by the water. Again, um, similar imagery to Psalm 1. Uh, on the other hand, the next verse, the heart, that is the human heart, is more deceitful than all else, and is desperately sick. Um, again, so that's something profound about human nature, something that maybe makes us uncomfortable, but it's true, that, that our heart is uh, deceived and sick, and so the one who trusts in the Lord will have life, stability, security, so on. Okay, chapter 20 is uh, an instance that we wanted to point out where Jeremiah is upset about the task that he has been given to be a prophet of God. Um, and so he says to God, O Lord, you have deceived me and I was deceived. Uh, strong language for Jeremiah to say, you tricked me into doing this. And not only that, you have overcome me, Jeremiah says, and, I have, uh, and, and you prevailed upon me. But two verses later, another key idea, Jeremiah is burdened by the work that God has given him to do, but... 
In the end, Jeremiah will say, if I say I will not speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones. The point being that uh, as much as it may hurt him to, to speak this message to God's people, he can't not speak this message to God's people. Um, and so that's chapter 20. Okay, we'll keep going here. And um, chapter 23, and I'm looking at how this came out here, and this is gonna, about to get thrown off. I should have checked the formatting on here. But chapter 23, I will raise up for David a branch. It's one of our images. He will reign as king and act wisely to do. What is the two things that kings are supposed to do? Justice and righteousness. Uh, that's what the Messiah will do, the one that comes from the line of David. Okay, uh, another contrast with the false prophets um, c uh, compared to Jeremiah, the true prophet. The question is, but who has stood in the counsel of the Lord? Here we go. Uh, that he should see and hear his word. That's the point. The prophets have not stood, in, or the false prophets have not stood in God's counsel. Uh, Jeremiah has. And so he's the one with God's message to speak. Uh, the whole land, chapter 25, a key prophecy here. The whole land will be a desolation and a horror. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon. How many years? Seventy. Okay. And these nations, uh, well, yeah, okay, so we got messed up there. Okay. Um, same, same context here of God's judgment, because after the 70 years, God's going to dole out his punishment on uh, other nations as well. And so he tells uh, Jeremiah, I think this is a new fill in the blank here. Take this cup of wine of, the cup of wine is, represents the wrath of God and cause all the nations where I send you to drink from it. Okay. Um, so God's wrath poured out upon all nations. All right. And then uh, this statement here, which is very famous, uh, you know, even now today, it's a kind of a cross stitch type of verse uh, that you might see hanging somewhere. But, uh, but we talk some about what this is, the context of this and, and what this is really getting at. But God says to the people in chapter 29, uh, I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare or plans for good. Uh, maybe your translation says, and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Um, but again, not immediately, not right away, and not maybe in the way that they anticipated. Uh, the point here is that there is punishment and judgment coming upon you. That's the 70 years. But eventually, God's plan in the long run is to, is to uh, visit his people, to bring them back to the land. So this is not a statement to say, you know, everything's going to work out fine and dandy for people uh, that belong to God, you know, right here in the, in the here and now or in the short term uh, or even in our lifetime. But it is a statement of confidence that in the end, God has good planned for those that belong to him, and uh, there is hope, uh, even as dark as the present may be. Okay, so that was uh, the end, or that, that was chapter 29, and uh, we, we had shown, according to our outline of the book, that uh, that then brought us into this middle section of the book that we call the Book of Comfort, a section of Jeremiah that focuses more on the hope that we just mentioned, the hope of the future of God's people. And uh, that's where we currently are. But there's two verses in particular from this section that I think are important. Um, th these hopefully uh, will, um, uh, well, at least one of them should be, uh, should be pretty familiar. But um, this is the key phrase in chapter 30, verse 3, that shows up quite a bit. But he says, Behold, days are coming when I will blank the blank of my people Israel and Judah. I will restore the fortunes. Yeah, I want you to have that phrase in your mind. Uh, it shows up all over the Old Testament, uh, but this is what God does. He, he restores the uh, poor fortunes of his people to reverse things and to do something great for them. Uh, and that's the promise of Jeremiah 30, uh, verse 3, is this book of consolation, this book of comfort opens up. Um, and then a passage that Steve just referenced a moment ago in his prayer. Behold, days are coming when I will make a new covenant uh, with the house of Israel and Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. And so what are we looking at in chapters 30 to 33? We are looking at God's promise of restoring the fortunes of his people 
um, not just to bring them back into the land of Judah and Jerusalem. Remember, there are layers here. So there is a message of people will come back from Babylon. They will come out of exile, and we know people like Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, Joshua, who uh, Daniel talked about uh, today from the book of Zechariah. We know that people will come back to the land, and that is being foretold here in these chapters. But ultimately, it is this, this new covenant. It is what God will do through the Messiah that, that is being looked forward to in these chapters. And we'll see both of those, I think, at work here, interwoven in a story told to us in Jeremiah 32. Um, okay, uh, I, I probably try to be too clever with my titles, uh, especially because no one probably pays attention to them, but um, I like this one. And I thought, okay, you know, who is it that's going to make the comment about, you know, the song reference uh, in the title of class? Not that anyone's actually in here, but, you know, someone's got to bring it up, surely. Um, and lo and behold, Natalie Moroles, she was the one. Of all, I would not have guessed it was going to be Natalie, but Natalie said, to, not to me, to her dad, why, why are we talking about Stevie Wonder in Bible class? So, uh, so props to, to, to Natalie. So uh, that song, I guess, was what? 40 years before she was born or something? Maybe, maybe 20 or 30 years, I don't know. You're like, well, it's before you were born too, you know, young whippersnapper. So I, it is true. It was before my time as well. Um, but let's talk about Jeremiah 32. And um, I had a sermon on, on this, this story about uh, three years ago, I believe. So if some of this sounds familiar to you. Uh, we, we did talk about it uh, in the r relatively uh, distant past. And so uh, uh, let's talk about uh, or start reading the story and notice what's going on. Um, and hopefully, because we've been studying Jeremiah, the, the characters, the scene, uh, the message will all kind of, you know, make more sense than just an isolated sermon uh, out of the blue a few years ago. Um, but notice what's going on here. We'll just begin by reading the first 15 verses of Jeremiah 32. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord... In the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. Now at that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard, which was in the house of the king of Judah, because Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Why do you prophesy, saying, Thus says the Lord? Behold, I am about to give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, will not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but he will surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will speak with him face to face and see him eye to eye. And he will take Zedekiah to Babylon, and he will be there until I visit him, declares the Lord. If you fight against the Chaldeans, you will not succeed. And Jeremiah said, Verse 6, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, is coming to you, saying, Buy for yourself my field which is at Anathoth, for you have the right of redemption to buy it. Then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the guard, according to the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field, please, that is at Anathoth, which is in the land of Benjamin, for you have the right of possession, and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. I bought the field, which was at Anathoth, from Hanamel, my uncle's son, and I weighed out the, silvers, the silver for him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed and sealed the deed, and called in witnesses, and weighed out the silver on the scales. Then I took the deeds of purchase, both the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, in the sight of Hanamel, my uncle's son, in the sight of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase before all the Jews who were sitting in the court of the guard. And I commanded Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take the deeds, this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed and put them in the earthenware jar that they may last a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. 
Okay, um, so again, I think we should be fairly uh, familiar with uh, the situation here, but notice the specifics. This is a story that's told to us. So we've talked some about in, in Jeremiah, just as a side note, about the, the different types of writing that there are uh, kind of just messages or oracles, sermons, um, so to speak, um, that are given to us, and there are stories that are told to us. And what we're seeing here is that in the book of comfort from 30 to 33, there's a mix. There's some of just the, the messages, like what we saw in 30 and 31. But here in 32, we have a story. So a different type of writing, but we're, what we're going to see is this, the same message that's being um, uh, given through this story as what we've seen in 30 and 31. So when is this story taking place? It says that this is the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah. We've seen Zedekiah before. Maybe you remember how long Zedekiah was king, um, 11 years. And maybe you remember that, that uh, Zedekiah was the last king that Judah had. Um, and so we're in the 10th year of the last king. So this is the uh, penultimate year. Just had to get that word in here somehow. This is 587, and the, uh, the, the walls are closing in, almost literally. Babylon is besieging Jerusalem. Remember, they had besieged Jerusalem before and taken some captives. Now they're besieging again. They maybe have been besieging for, for maybe even a year at this point. Um, but they are squeezing Jerusalem out. They are starving them. They are choking them. The end is near. At least as we see it, the end is near. And in reality, uh, or, or I say we see it that way because we know the reality of the situation. Okay. Jeremiah, also, uh, this is familiar to us, he is in prison uh, for his message. This is not as bad of a spot as Jeremiah will find himself uh, in other parts of the book. This is probably like an open courtyard that's kind of barricaded off. Um, as we see in, in, in the verses that we read, he can have visitors. And so he's not like in, in a pit like he will be later um, or, uh, you know, in the deepest dungeon or anything like that. But he is in prison. And why? Because of what he said. And we've seen this before. He says, his message is, Jerusalem is going to fall, and Zedekiah will be taken. Um, and this is really the, the kicker here, okay? The point is, uh, of, of Jeremiah's message, don't fight back, okay? It's, it's, it's futile, it's useless to fight back against the Babylonians because uh, you're done for, all right? Uh, you, you can imagine if you're a king of a people, you don't want uh, anybody going around saying that. Okay, that's treasonous, really. Uh, it's, it's subversive to go around and say, don't fight back. You know, just give up, just surrender. Okay, uh, so Zedekiah has imprisoned Jeremiah for this message. All right, so what happens uh, while Jeremiah is in prison? Well, uh, an odd thing happens. We've seen odd things before, but here's another odd thing that Jeremiah is asked to do. He is asked to buy a field, okay? Now, there's more uh, to this, and um, we had some lessons actually recently. Steve talked about the book of Ruth, and so this language of redemption may be uh, familiar to us. Remember that um, the Israelites wanted to, by the command of God, uh, so to say God wanted to uh, keep the land of the Israelites within their own family, Okay? Uh, he didn't want the land to be sold off and then get mixed up between the tribes or between the families. As we said in our lesson this morning, actually, this was their inheritance. And so it was supposed to stay in the family. Okay, so if you needed to sell a field, uh, sell a piece of property, um, then you would find the closest family member. And that family member would be the redeemer. And they would purchase that land. And, and the language of redemption I think it relates to the fact that you're likely selling this land uh, because you need the money, right? Um, likely there may be a, a lien, as we would say, uh, uh, on the property because of debt, or there are other financial obligations that the person cannot meet unless they sell this property. And so the redeemer comes in, this close family member, and purchases the land uh, from them uh, to, to help them out in that way. Okay. So that's kind of what's happening here. Um, you can imagine in this time, maybe why Hanamel is hurting. Jeremiah holds that, that place of being the, the redeemer. But even still, even with all of that, why in the world would Jeremiah uh, want to 
um, or decide to purchase a piece of property right now, okay? This wouldn't seem to make any sense. Uh, for one, uh, that land is actually behind, and it's in Benjamin, so it's behind the siege line. So how are you going to get out there, right? But maybe more than that, Jeremiah knows what is, uh, what is about to happen. And so why, when the people are about to be taken away and the city destroyed, would anybody be purchasing um, land? We'd say the market's, you know, in a really bad shape at this point in, uh, in Judah and Jerusalem. But Jeremiah is told to purchase it. And by the way, he doesn't purchase it for very much. So, you know, uh, low market, you know, cheap price. But, uh, but then, and this is, it's amazing how this is spelled out, right? There's two copies of the deed. You know, one is open to, to be looked at. Uh, you know, publicly, one is closed or sealed up so that if there's any dispute in a court, you know, they can check, you know, the official closed copy. But those deeds are all, you know, it's all signed, you know, and, and, and taken care of. But then Jeremiah tells Baruch, uh, of the instruction of God, to put these in a jar, okay? Uh, we're going to come, we're going to see Baruch more later on, so keep Baruch in mind. He is uh, called a scribe later on, um, which would mean he's kind of like an attorney, um, not so much in like the trial sense as we think of it today, but even still today, attorneys are the ones that, you know, process and administer all this legal paperwork and things. And so, uh, so Baruch, that's his specialty. That's who he is. He's a scribe. And so he puts all this together and they're going to preserve the deeds. Why are they going to preserve this, uh, the memory or the record of this purchase of Jeremiah? And the reason is because God says in verse 15, this is a sign of what's to come. That there is coming a day, again, in the land where houses and fields and vineyards will be bought and sold. Um, Jeremiah is told, in a manner of speaking, to put his money where his mouth is. If he's been saying that this is uh, going to uh, be reversed by God at some point, that God is going to restore our fortunes and bring us back to the land. If you're saying that, Jeremiah... Um, well, then here's an action that will show your confidence in that message to spend his money to buy this field, uh, which is in the land of Anathoth. And that's what Jeremiah does. Um, but how does he feel about it? That's what we're going to see next. Let's read uh, Jeremiah's prayer in verses 16 to 25. It says, After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, then I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you, who shows loving kindness. Uh, that's our steadfast love word. Um, just mention that again. To thousands, but repays the iniquity of fathers into the bosom of their children after them, O great and mighty God. The Lord of hosts is his name, great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds, who has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, and even to this day, both in Israel and among mankind. And you have made a name for yourself as at this day. You have brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders and with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terror, and gave them this land which you swore to their forefathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 23, they came in and took possession of it, but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law, and they, uh, they have done nothing of all that you've commanded them to do. Therefore, you have made all this calamity come upon them. Behold, the siege ramps have reached the city to take it, and the city is given into the hand of Chaldean, the Chaldeans to fight against it because of the sword, the famine, and the pestilence. And what you have spoken has come to pass, and behold, you see it. You have said to me, O Lord God, buy for yourself the field with money, call in witnesses, although the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. Okay, uh, there's a lot here. Um, but, but I think for the most part, um, all, all of, a lot of this is, um, say, self-explanatory, or again, based on what we know about the situation and Jeremiah and the people, uh, we get it. We get what Jeremiah is saying. 
This is a prayer that begins with praise, and in, in some ways it's actually uh, similar to what we uh, talked about this morning in Psalm 136, that he is acknowledging God's power um, and says, you know, it, it, nothing is too hard for you. I know that, God. Okay. He acknowledges God's uh, justice, okay? This language comes from uh, uh, Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. Um, I, I thought about taking us there this morning to explain this idea of steadfast love. Exodus 34, 6 and 7, I heard referred to one time as the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament, which I thought was pretty good. Um, because it keeps on getting alluded to and referred to all throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, this is the moment where God says to Moses uh, in the cleft of the rock, you know, the Lord, the Lord God, uh, that he is, uh, he is uh, merciful and compassionate, uh, that he is abounding in steadfast love, that he shows steadfast love to thousands, um, and he shows forgiveness, and he does not let the guilty go unpunished. It's a description of God's nature, of his faithful character. Um, and, uh, and so all throughout Israel's history, they refer back to that to say, this is who God is. And so Jeremiah says, God, this is who you are. You're faithful um, and you're wise. He says, you have great counsel. And he refers to the creation, he refers to the history of Israel through here to say, God, uh, I know who you are. I know how powerful you are. I know how just you are. I know how wise you are. Why is Jeremiah going through all of this to, to, uh, to say all this about God? Well, it's because there's something that he uh, doesn't quite understand. After recounting God's uh, deliverance of the people and giving them the promised land, um, he goes on with the history because Jeremiah knows what happened. He says, these people disobeyed. Jeremiah is pretty harsh. Um, notice he says, they have done nothing that you commanded them. Okay. Um, I think Jeremiah is using hyperbole here. It's not that the Israelites never ever did one single thing right. But that's how Jeremiah summary said, they didn't do anything right. They didn't do anything that you told them to do. And because of that, now you have brought this calamity upon them, right? Why is Jeremiah going through this? What is Jeremiah's question? His question is this, why in the world are you telling me to buy this field? He knows that the, that, that the end is near. He knows that the siege is closing in, that the city is about to be destroyed, okay? And he knows that God is the one who has done this. And so why, God, are you telling me to buy this field? Uh, several things we could say about this, just about the nature of Jeremiah's question. Um, and uh, it, it may be a little bit confusing to us because we think, well, you know, Jeremiah has been told uh, both the message of judgment and the message of hope. So why is it surprising to him, you know, that, uh, that God is telling him to do this? Um, a few things we would say about it. One is that uh, we're, we're often quick to, um, you know, point out or to, you know, rebuke others for their, their doubting uh, and for not understanding. When I think if we're, we're honest with ourselves, we understand that, that even if we've heard things before, uh, it is easy in times of confusion to doubt and to be uncertain, to question. I can't help but think of an example like John the Baptist and, if you know, uh, that, that's maybe the most confusing one of all, that, you know, John was going around saying the Messiah is he coming. He's here. You know, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And yet, when John was in prison and Jesus was out doing his ministry, maybe Jesus' ministry looked different than what John was expecting. But remember, John sent messengers to Jesus to say, are you the one to come or are we supposed to be looking for somebody else? Okay. It is uh, common, and again, we would put ourselves in the same situation, that uh, in moments of difficulty, um, we uh, can get confused and doubt and have our uncertainties. But actually, the John instance uh, or, or story is, is maybe a good uh, parallel here, because what did John do when he had his questions? Well, he went to Jesus and said, Jesus, you know, what, what's going on here? Tell me uh, what's up. And what does Jeremiah do with his questions? He goes to the Lord. He prays to God. And there's another thing we would say about it too, which is that Jeremiah, if, if, if he's praying this prayer after purchasing the field, okay, if it doesn't make sense to him then, then it probably didn't make sense to him when he was uh, approached early on about uh, buying the field. 
And so Jeremiah didn't understand God's command to him. He didn't understand why in the world he's supposed to buy this field. But what did he do? He bought the field, okay? He did what God told him to do, even though he didn't understand it. And then, because he had these questions in his heart, he took them directly to God and uh, prayed to him, acknowledged his power, acknowledged his wisdom, uh, and said, God, you're great, you're awesome, you're just, but I don't understand what's going on here. Why are you telling me to buy the field? Okay, uh, let's keep going here, and uh, we're just going to read the rest of the chapter. Oh, man. My animations failed me. Uh, so uh, let's see if you can go to, uh, if Robert can work some magic here, just go to the screen uh, where without the PowerPoint. Um, and uh, if you can just make that come up after everything else. Um, and so uh, this is kind of nice. If you can't, you know, when you're in here, it's like you can see it. All my tricks are given away, but, but now we can do it behind the scenes, uh, behind the curtain, so to speak, and then come back to it. Okay. So uh, let's read the rest of uh, chapter 32, starting in verse 26. A little bit of a long reading, but notice what God's response is to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am about to give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will take Nebuchadnezzar, uh, sorry, he will take it. The Chaldeans who are fighting against this city will enter and set this city on fire and burn it with the houses where people have offered incense to Baal on their roofs and poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. Indeed, the sons of Israel and the sons of Judah have been doing only evil in my sight from their youth. For the sons of Israel have been only provoking me to anger by the work of their hands, declares the Lord. Indeed, this city has become to me a provocation of my anger and my wrath from the day that they built it, even to this day, so that they should be removed from before my face. Because of the evil of the sons of Israel and the sons of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their leaders, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they have turned their back to me and not their face, though I taught them, teaching them again and again. They would not listen and receive instruction, but they put their detestable things in the house which is called by my name to defile it. They built the high places of Baal that are in the valley of, of Ben-Hinnom and caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I had not commanded them, nor had it entered my mind that they should do this abomination." to cause Judah to sin. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the city of which you say, it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all the lands to which I have driven them in my anger, in my wrath, in my indignation, and I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. They shall be my people, and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. And I will make them, I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. I will rejoice over them to do them good and will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I brought all this great disaster on this people, so I am going to bring on them all the good that I am promising them. Fields will be bought in this land of which you say, it is a desolation without man or beast. It is given in the hands of the Chaldeans. Men will buy fields for money. Sign and seal deeds and call in witnesses in the land of Benjamin, in the environs of Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the lowland, and in the cities of the Negev. For I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. Okay, thank you, Robert. It's like nothing ever happened. We're right back on track here. Uh, so this is God's response. And again, it's a little bit long. Um, and it's involved. There's a lot that's said here, 
But I think you read the whole thing, you see what God's saying, we get it. Okay, we get God's message to Jeremiah, partly because it's so um, reminiscent of things that have already been said in the book. God begins by kind of echoing Jeremiah's words. Remember, Jeremiah had said, you know, nothing is too hard for you. And so God responds by saying, really? <laughs> is anything too hard for me? Do you really believe that, Jeremiah? Okay. And I think Jeremiah does believe it, but God is reiterating it to say, hey, if, you've, if you believe it, then, then believe it. Then trust in it. Okay. Um, and then God goes through what Jeremiah's case. Remember, Jeremiah's case was... God, I know you're awesome, but these people have rejected you, and, and, and you are punishing them and destroying the city because of their sins. So why are we buying a field here? So God goes through that and says, you know what? You're exactly right. Um, I am giving Jerusalem over as a consequence for their evil. And if we thought Jeremiah was harsh on the people, I think God takes it up a notch here. I don't know, uh, but, but God seems to go into even more detail, use even more strong language about how bad the people have been. And here's our list here. They, they, they have been a provocation to anger. Remember, Jeremiah said, uh, they have done nothing of what you told them to do. And God says something similar. He says, they have only done evil, verse 30, and they have only been provoking me to anger. It actually is a description that sounds more like uh, what we read in Genesis chapter 6 of the state of the world in the time of Noah. They only did what was evil continually, okay? Only, all, all that was in their mind was only evil continually, okay? Verse 32, everybody is to blame. We've seen this before in the book, but he goes down the list from kings and leaders and priests and prophets all the way down to the people that inhabit the cities. Everybody has turned their back to God and not turned their face to him, even though he had outstretched arms and was teaching them the whole time, leading them in, steadfast love, they rejected him. And 34 and 35, we've seen before, but uh, again, it's, you know, uh, maybe we still can't wrap our minds around it. That on one hand, that they would um, put idols, just worshiping idols was a rejection of God, obviously. But the fact that they would put idols in the temple of the Lord uh, is astounding, okay? Um, Someone used this example in teaching Jeremiah. I don't think I've used, uh, gone quite this far with it yet, but, but it is striking, even if it's hard to, hard to swallow or hard to imagine. But imagine that a wife uh, is unfaithful to her husband, and not just once, but she is constantly unfaithful, not just with one other man, but with uh, a bunch of other men. And uh, not only does she go that far, but then, as all these affairs, she starts bringing the uh, pictures of these men and setting those pictures up in her husband's house and uh, taking their, you know, possessions and displaying them around his house. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's just so, that's so nonsensical to us. So outside the realm of our imagination, the hurt and the pain that that would cause. And yeah, this is what Israel, the bride of God, was doing to him, setting up images of these idols in his house. And then, verse 35, uh, to take their own children and to offer them as burnt offerings to uh, the gods, specifically to Molech. And so God says, Jeremiah, you're exactly right. This people have been uh, wicked. They have been evil. And so they deserve all of the punishment that I am bringing upon them. Oh, it happened again. So just do the same thing you did before. Uh, we're good. Um, but God goes on in the following verses, specifically in 36 and following, to say what we're, we've seen in this, uh, in this message in chapter 30 and 31. Say, yes, that they are given over into the hand of Babylon to die by sword, famine, and pestilence. But, verse 37, behold, I will gather them out of the lands to which I have driven them in my anger, in my wrath, and in my indignation to bring them back and to dwell in safety. So again, we're, we're seeing uh, layers of this, um, th this hope, this promise to the people um, that uh, he starts by saying, um, the people are going to come back to the land. They are going to return here and they are going to dwell in safety. But notice the turn in verse 38, which uh, that's fine, right? that's, that's good enough. Okay? Um, and so they're going to come back to the land. But notice that in verse 38, this uh, is again what we've seen in chapter 31, maybe especially 
the final or the, the ultimate restoration of his people. Um, as soon as you see in verse 38, our phrase here, they shall be my people and I will be their God, that should be one of those trigger phrases to say, okay, we're talking about the big one here, the big restoration, the ultimate restoration that God is going to uh, fulfill for his people in Jesus. Um, and so that phrase comes up. Uh, we're a little bit outward here, but it's fine, okay? Uh, they will be my people, I will be their God. Language like in 39, I will give them one heart and one way. Okay. Again, this is like what we've seen back in chapter 31. It's interesting kind of putting these together. Um, God says he's going to give them one heart and one way. Uh, the people have not had one heart and one way. They have been not only divided amongst themselves, but they've been separated from God because of their sin. They've been taking, remember judges, uh, you know, each one did what was right in his own eyes, right? So uh, they have not had one heart. They have not had one way. But God will give them one heart and one way. Remember what he said in 31. What will God do to their hearts in chapter 31? He said he would write his law on their hearts. Okay. Even in this passage, notice that he says a little bit later on, what is that in verse uh, 40? I will put the fear of me in their hearts. Okay. So all this is, is, it goes together. God will write his law on their hearts. He will put the fear of him in their hearts and the people will all have one heart. And with that one heart, they will, uh, they will have one way. Um, and we, we see that language picked up maybe in the New Testament. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And remember in the book of Acts, uh, Christians are referred to as the way. That's kind of the shorthand uh, that's used, um, you know, for their movement of those that follow Jesus, who is himself the way. Uh, and so that's what God will do for them. Uh, the language of everlasting covenant, of course, connects back to the new covenant that chapter 31 said God will make. In verse 41, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. This is just amazing that uh, God uh, says, I will do them good. That's, I mean, that's amazing enough. And that goes back to our, our uh, verse in chapter 29, right? I know the plans I have for you to do you good to, to, and not harm. God has good plan for his people after the calamity. But it's not just that God's going to do his people good. He says, I will rejoice over you to do you good. God is going to love blessing his people. He is going to be so happy to do good for his people and to restore them uh, once again and to bring them back to himself. And he's not doing it half-heartedly. He's not doing it just out of obligation. Verse 41 ends by saying that he will plant them in the land with all his heart and with all his soul. This is what God has planned for his people. And so he reiterates the hopeful promise. And the point is, we see here, the point is again, because again, the question was, why am I buying the field? The point is that fields will again be bought and sold in the land. And so again, Jeremiah's act is a, uh, is a uh, down payment, so to speak, of what is to come. Jeremiah's act is a sign to say there is a future. May not be right around the corner. It's not going to be just in a few years. And there's going to be a lot of hardship between now and then. The city is going to be destroyed. And that destruction of Jerusalem is because of the sins of the people. But after that, God will, not only in the short term, but especially he will in the long term, restore his people. Restore their fortunes. He will turn things around. And so Jeremiah's purchase of the field is an act of believing in God's uh, promise of a future hope and a future restoration. And that is the message of Jeremiah 32. And again, it, it is the same message of chapter 30 and 31, um, that God has a, has a plan for hope beyond the, uh, beyond the calamity. But it, uh, chapter 32 uh, expresses that message in this uh, interesting, fun story about Jeremiah uh, making his real estate purchase uh, while in prison there in the court of Zedekiah. Okay, one more chapter in, the, uh, in this, this uh, center piece of the book and the, the section of hope and comfort. And we will get to that on Wednesday when we cover chapter 33. And so uh, you can be reading that um, in the meantime. 
But uh, thank you again, as always, for joining us. Don't forget, as Mike mentioned earlier in our announcements, the uh, Zoom opportunities that are for kids this afternoon um, and uh, on Monday night, an adult class for the book of Acts. Um, check your email. You may have to go far back or search in your email to find links for those things. Uh, but, uh, but those are available. And uh, then we'll be back here Wednesday night um, virtually on the YouTube channel for our study of Jeremiah. Uh, so thanks again for joining us. Have a good rest of the day.